Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Is it possible for anyone to be entitled to the suffering of someone else? Is it possible for someone to obtain the right to see someone else harmed? That is a question that is lurking in the background of many of the decisions that we face as a community, both in our time and place and throughout human history. When debates and discussions of, for example, capital punishment come up, very often the arguments made are not about deterring crime necessarily or uh, what is good for society as a whole, but the idea that the families and loved ones of victims are morally entitled to the death of the person convicted of killing their loved one. That the moral scales of the universe will be somehow balanced out by that action. Or when we uh, faced public debate over the last year or so around the question of forgiving $10,000 of student loan debt for people making under a certain amount of money, which is a these are, these are very difficult public policy questions, and I, I don't mean to suggest that there is some kind of obvious, easy answer here, and there are problems with these things. But the arguments very often revolved around the idea that people who had paid off their debt were somehow being cheated by the fact that someone else would have to pay a little less that those of us who had paid off our student loan balances were entitled to see other people struggle and wait to buy homes, to form families, uh, face the prospect of bankruptcy or kind of permanent indebtedness because we had already done the part that we needed to do to get free of that. Can anyone be entitled to see someone else suffer? Now, these are, these are difficult questions. And my own personal views on these things are not as exactly black and white. But what I'm interested in is the mindset. The belief that the world will break down if someone else doesn't get a punishment that they are due. I have this argument sometimes uh, if you become a pastor, if you go to seminary, you'll, you'll get to have these arguments too about universal salvation. If everybody, if there is no hell, there are people who genuinely seem like they will feel ripped off, like I did all these good things and nobody even ended up in hell. Like, well, that's maybe not the right way we want to be looking at, at doing good things. But are we ever entitled to someone else's suffering? In the story that we get today from the book of Jonah, Jonah has already done the things that he is famous for. God tells him to go to Nineveh and preach to Nineveh that disaster is coming in two and three days, that Nineveh will be no more. And Jonah hears that and says, no, I'm, okay, no, I'm not going to do that. And Jonah goes as far away as he possibly can. He gets on a ship figuring, okay, well, God lives in Israel, so if I go as far away as I can, then maybe God won't find me. Um, but that's not how it works. And so the storm catches the ship, and, uh, and Jonah says, okay, look, guys, this is because of me, so just chuck me into the, into the ocean because I'm the, I'm the reason that... The, uh, that we're in this storm, so they throw him overboard, and Jonah gets swallowed by the whale, and in the whale for three days, he kind of has a change of heart, I imagine. I imagine a lot would change for you if you were inside a whale for three days. Um, probably a lot of interesting thoughts, but he, he sing, sings this beautiful, this beautiful hymn, and then, and then the whale belches him up onto dry land, and Jonah decides to finally, after having exhausted all the other options, he's going to do what God tells him. 
So he goes to Nineveh. And Nineveh is a, a big city. And it's not just a big city. It's a city that is at the center of an empire that is the kind of big bully on the block, including sort of being an overbearing and dangerous neighbor and sometimes a kind of occupying imperial power for the people of Israel. So Jonah has been told not just to go to a big city and say something unpopular, he has been told to go to a big city, go to the belly of the imperial beast and say, you're all going to die because of all your wickedness. But Jonah does it. He goes through the city. He walks through the city. He proclaims his oracle of judgment and doom. And then he goes up onto the hillside to watch what's going to happen to Nineveh. But the strangest thing happened. The people of Nineveh, the king and the people, decided, wait a minute. We better do something about this. And maybe if we repent, maybe if we Uh, show our remorse, maybe God will refrain from punishing us. So that's what they do. They have a fast, a public fast, and and there is uh, ashes and sackcloth and mourning, and God relents. God changes his mind about the disaster that he was going to bring on to Nineveh, and how does Jonah react to that? I am so angry that I wish I would just die. That's Jonah's reaction. God, you didn't need to send me all this way to do nothing. I knew, I knew because it's part of my covenant with you, your covenant with me, that you are gracious and merciful, that you relent from punishing, and now you are doing this for Nineveh after all of this? After all their many sins? Just three days of going hungry and wearing ashes on their head and it's all just fine? Jonah is furious and God asks him one of my favorite questions in all the scriptures. And it's a question that I think you cannot ask yourself often enough. And that is, is it right for you to be angry? So Jonah sits and sulks and he's angry and God creates, he calls forth a a, a vine, a bush that grows up over Jonah in a day and protects him from the heat of the day and then the next morning God sends a worm to kill the bush and the bush withers and dies and then God sends a hot wind and Jonah who... Uh, uh, I, 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 I I I can empathize with this after the summer we've had. So the hot wind and the sun, I just, just kill me. And God says, is it right for you to be angry about the vine, about the bush? And Jonah says, you're darn right it is. Angry enough to die. What you're doing to me here, God. And God says, if you're upset about the bush, which you didn't do anything to make, which was grew in a day and died in a day, easy come, easy go, if you're so upset about the bush, imagine how I feel about Nineveh, wicked city that it is, which has 120,000 souls in it, plus the animals, which I made, which I created for my glory. This disproportion between the human perspective and God's perspective is is something that Jesus picks up in the parable that he tells to his listeners today that we hear in our gospel. Jesus says, kingdom of heaven is like this. Kingdom of heaven is like this. A landowner needs to get his harvest brought in, so he goes out to find day laborers. And in the morning, he hires day laborers. And at nine o'clock, he comes back and he hires some more. And he agrees, you get the daily wage. And then later on, he says, you'll get what's right. And he hires more at nine. And he hires more at noon. And he hires some more at three o'clock. And then he comes back at five o'clock. We're getting to the end of the day. And there are people still there waiting to get hired. 
What are you doing here? Idle all day. Well, no one has hired us, they say. Now, we can imagine a couple things about the people who might be in this situation. One possibility is that there has been a drought or a famine in some nearby part of the world, and people who had a place to live and work have had to leave it to find the means of survival somewhere else. This happens all the time in human history. It's happening right now in our own hemisphere and in the Mediterranean world. Crops fail. Uh, drought destroys agricultural economies. Uh, whole nations can experience economic collapse, and people who had a way to live lose that way to live, and they have no choice but to look for an opportunity somewhere else, because otherwise they will die. And there may be, in situations of large-scale migration, there may be too many people for the work that is available. So it might be that these people who are sitting around unhired at the end of the day have been kicked off their land, or they have lost their land, or they've lost their way to make a living, and there's simply too many of them. Or, or it may be that those who are unhired at the end of the day are more aged, or infirm, or injured from a life of hard agricultural labor. And they are the marginal workers who will provide fewer picked grapes per day of work. And so they can only get hired when there is a real need. And today, there is no real need. So they, whether they are newly arrived migrants, whether they are people who have been worn down and are no longer as useful to the agricultural economy, they are staring down the barrel of a day, perhaps not the first day, in which they will have to go back to their household with nothing to show for it. Someone is counting on each of these people to bring home a wage, and they will bring home nothing. So when the landowner says, okay, it's five o'clock, but go get, you know, head on down to the vineyard and, and put in an hour of work, they are all thinking, well, it's better than nothing. But then, at the end of the day, it's pay time, and the manager is instructed I love the detail. Jesus, Jesus adds the best details in his parables. He said, the landowner says, the man, manager, go do it this way. You know, the customer service rep, he can handle all this. <laughs> the manager is instructed to pay the late arrivals first and to give them the full daily wage. And the people who arrived at 3 o'clock, the full daily wage. And the ones who were hired at noon and at 9 o'clock, the full daily wage. And so the ones who went out first in the morning, who were first hired, think, we're in for a good payday here. But they get the daily wage that they agreed to, not 12 hours earlier. And they are angry. Surely their, their expectation that they will get paid in an equivalently generous way has been, has been dashed, and, and they're unhappy about that. But they specifically say to the landowner, you have made us equal to them. In other words, they would not be mad if those people who were hired at 5 p.m. came away with next to nothing and went home hungry. That would be fine. That would be just fine. But you paid them the same as you paid me, and that is not acceptable. Because I am entitled to see them go hungry on account of what I have done all day. And the landowner says to them, our, our translation is kind of wimpy here. Our translation says, are you envious because I am generous? But in the Greek, he says, has your eye become evil because I have been good? Are you giving me the evil eye? Are you wishing ill on me or on your fellow laborer because I did a good thing? Or to put it another way, is it right for you to be angry? Is it right for you to wish ill on these people? 
Now, I always want to be careful with a parable, and Jonah is a parable too. Jonah is, a, is kind of a folk tale, and, and, and Jesus is telling kind of a folk tale here. I want to be careful that we don't turn the elements of the story into a one-to-one relationship with something outside of the story. The landowner in this story is not God, and the picture of compensation here is not the picture of a good society. This landowner is going to have a very hard time finding workers at six o'clock in the morning the next day, once it becomes known that everybody gets the same, paid the same for one hour or for 12, right? And a, a good and a just society is going to set a reasonable minimum for how much a worker gets paid and is going to have certain rules about how they get hired and on what basis. And a humane and good society will create some kind of insurance for people who become too old to do their work or who experience injuries or disabilities in their work. And it is even a basic human right for the workers in this vineyard, like everywhere else, to to band themselves together and advocate for their own interests against their landowners and employers. That is a right that is acknowledged, including the right to withhold their labor as a group in order to get better treatment. That is a basic human right. It's acknowledged by all of the churches. Um, You know, a hundred and more years ago, it's controversial in the United States for reasons that we'll get into another time. But that is a basic human right. That is what you need in order to have workers get paid, not just fairly, but adequately. But Jesus is not telling us a fable about a good society. He's telling us about the kingdom of God. And what he is telling us inside this fable is that grace is always hard to watch in practice. If it is really grace, if it is really the unmerited, undeserved love and forgiveness and mercy of God, if it is really and truly grace, it will always make someone mad. Isn't that an interesting thought? Is your eye evil because I've been good? Is it right for you to be angry about what didn't happen to Nineveh? When God is truly in the business of giving out grace, of showing love and mercy, it will create discomfort because it will look and it will be the case that the people who receive it did not deserve it, did not earn it, did not merit it because that's what grace is. And the punchline of this story is that no one knows in advance whether they are going to be called to the vineyard at the first hour or the ninth hour or the twelfth hour. No one knows in advance whether they are living in Nineveh or living in some other place. We do not know. Now, this is hard for me to say because I come from farm people. I come from dairy farm people. I come from Wisconsin where we pride ourselves on being the first up and first out the door and first into the vineyard. And and by golly, we earn everything. And and people do. They work hard, and I'm not denying that. But we never know where we stand with God because our own experiences, our own stories we tell can deceive us. And the danger with the anger that is kindled in Jonah's heart and with the evil eye that these day-long laborers are, are conceiving against their fellows, the danger with these powers is that we will ultimately turn them on ourselves. Because the time will come when all of us will skid into the door at the last possible minute. When all of us will repent like Nineveh, not having known our right from our left. And the only safe assumption we can ever make is that all of us and any of us at any given time need just as much grace and mercy and patience from God as anyone else has ever needed. Because we know, because God tells us, 
that that is exactly the amount of mercy and grace and patience and forgiveness that God is willing to extend. Amen.